monetizing digital services since 2004, boosting the entertainment industry by making digital content accessible for everyone. AWG, where innovation meets monetization. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. You enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Errol Pierre about his new book, The Way Up, Climbing the Corporate Mountain as a Professional of Color. Errol Pierre, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you for having me, John. Great to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from New York. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about your recent book, The Way Up, Climbing the Corporate Mountain as a Professional of Color. As we get started, I just wanted to briefly share Errol's bio with everybody. Errol Pierre is an in-demand speaker on leadership, diversity, and healthcare, and has addressed hundreds of audiences, including the National Urban League for Young Professionals, 100 Black Men, and Fordham University, among others. Again, a pleasure to be with you. Anything else you would like to share with me or my audience by way of your background or personal context before we dive on it? I think you got it all there. Uh, I also teach as well. Uh, I enjoy teaching health economics at uh, NYU, Baruch, and Columbia University. That is fantastic. And I'm, uh, you know, listeners of the podcast now, I'm a university professor and I do consulting work and things like this podcast on the side. Um, And I'm an administrator at my university. And one of the areas in my um, department that I lead is uh, healthcare administration. And and so we have some wonderful faculty that teach similar types of things um, that sounds like uh, you focus your time on. And I think it's fantastic that you're giving back in that way and contributing and helping to raise up the next generation of professionals in the field. Absolutely. The healthcare has lots of challenges, so we need lots of smart people to help fix it uh, in the future to come. All right. Now with your book, I, I like to ask authors, you know, why this book? Why now? What really inspired you to go write it? I mean, a, a book is a is a labor of love. It's it's a lot of hard work, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. You're putting a lot of yourself into it. So why this book? Why now? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it was a culmination of lots of different factors. So I, like a lot of other people, found themselves alone in a 900 square foot apartment in the Bronx during the pandemic in the height of uh, 2020, uh, watching TV like everybody else and seeing on the news the murder of George Floyd. And then also with my healthcare background, seeing the disproportionate impact of COVID on communities of color. And I think uh, everyone realizes that New York was an epicenter. So in March, uh, when it happened here in New York City, it, everything shut down. Uh, you can't imagine Times Square being empty and what that means. You know, there's a seismic shock to our system. And so I'm alone in my apartment it's watching this murder that just unfolded for eight minutes and uh, seeing people dying, uh, you know, because of COVID. And just was able to reflect on my career uh, through healthcare as well as, as a, a person of color in America. And that's when I started to think through, like, I didn't get here by chance. I had to be very intentional about my progress there and started to say, let me, you know, do some research around what it takes for people of color to move up in corporate America. I'll match that research up with my own anecdotal experiences professionally and personally. 
And then I had the opportunity, like many, to talk to friends and colleagues. Uh, so I interviewed actually 11 other executives of color for the book, too. And the book really came together as me just having a moment of of like uh, silence and just reflection of how I got to where I got to. Because I think I've been running for so long, the pandemic made me pause and think, and I had the opportunity to write down my thoughts. And so that's, that's really where it, where it came from, um, the, the, the racial reckoning we had in the country and trying to put my thoughts on paper as what it, what it, what it meant to me. Yeah, yeah. The, the racial reckoning, that's a great way to put it. And we haven't fully reconciled, have we? I mean, it's an ongoing (laughs) uh, challenge. Certainly um, that period uh, in the spring and summer of 2020 was a really, really, really rough time Uh, from a social justice standpoint, from a pandemic standpoint, global geopolitical stuff, like everything, right? Piling on all at the same time. Absolutely. Uh, And and so I, I really appreciate you being vulnerable and taking the time to put your thoughts down as well as interview others to give them voice uh, as you put together this book. Now I, you, you talk about a lot of different things around um, your experience and what it's like as a person of color uh, in your field, you know, to, to get a leg up, to, to progress in your career. Um, maybe we can start before we dig into that more specifically, we can start by talking a little bit about, alignment, alignment of passion and purpose, um, how you were able to find that for yourself and how that has provided a foundation for you as you've sought to progress in your career? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, And it happened accidentally, but uh, there's absolutely alignment in what I do today between what I love to do and why I think I'm here on the planet and then what I actually get paid to do at work. And so I, I just feel very fortunate that those two things converged because it's great because then, then you feel like you're not ever working, right? If you uh, love what you do. How it happened was very, you know, uh, random. But uh, I grew up from uh, two parents that were immigrants. They're both from Haiti. So my dad grew up in Gonaive, which is a small farm town in Haiti, uh, about north of the, the capital. And my mom grew up in Patronville. And they moved to America in the 70s as part of uh, running away from the regime at the time, which was Baby Doc, which was a despotic leader. And so they came to America, humble you know, beginnings, working blue collar jobs. My dad had like five different jobs that he was working. And I just observed him as a child working so hard uh, as so many hours just to put food on the table and, and keep a roof over our head and realized that we had benefits. We had healthcare benefits from a union and uh, those benefits didn't actually cover all of the expenses I had. So when I was a kid, I had you know to get some dental work done and it was this weird process where uh, I couldn't get the full dental work done in one year because I reached my maximum. And so I had to wait till the next year to start to work over again. And as a child, I had no idea what it meant. Uh, but that lingered in with me for so long that I happened to bump into um, a healthcare opportunity, which is another story. You know, I was uh, um, uh, stocking shelves at a beauty supply store. And a woman who's seen me at that store over a longer period of time, because I worked there for like six years, uh, she basically said, Hey, you know, I think you do more than just this. And I said, like, yes, you know, I'm, I'm in college, uh, part-time. This is my uh, part-time job, but I go to school. She's like, do you have a resume? Absolutely. So, you know, emailed her my resume. Long behold, she was the chief operating officer of one of the largest health insurance plans in New York at the time. So, um, got my, <laughs> my first internship at a major health insurance company, uh, stocking shelves, sucking shampoo bottles on shelves. And to put two and two together, um, you know, the work ethic that I saw my dad do, he woke up at four in the morning. That was the same work ethic I had putting those shampoo bottles away. And that's what led to the COO to ask me for my resume. And then I ended up working at an insurance company where now I could ask the question, why do benefits end at the end of the year and you have to restart at the beginning of the year? And that's what sort of turned into this passion around health equity and saying, we shouldn't have to cut benefits for people. Uh, they should get the healthcare they need. Uh, and everyone should have equal 
and equitable access to high quality healthcare that is dignified and, and treats them like a human being. Uh, and that's sort of been my pursuit ever since. So I, I always say shampoo saved my life. Um, but that's really where it linked together. And from there, it's just blossomed. That blossoming that I think we all have to kind of figure out for ourselves, everyone's passion and purpose is a little bit different and unique, right? And that's totally fine. Um, And the fact that you were able to find that for yourself and that you had others around you who believed in you who were able to advocate for you and help provide opportunities was a tremendous thing. And it speaks to the need for us to do the same for others, to pay it forward. So absolutely, if, if, if we have benefits, we have privileges, we have um, you know, I, I uh, systemic, um, privilege, you know, I, I'm a straight cisgender white dude. So I have a lot of layers of privilege. Um, I hope, hopefully I leverage that to be an ally and an advocate and, per, you know, support and provide opportunities, uh, for others and, and, you know, leverage the privilege that I have in ways that are going to be helpful and useful to other people so that we can strive for that equity um, in the world around us. And again, recognizing that it, it's different for everyone in terms of what their, their purpose and passion is and, and trying to, rather than fit a, a square peg in a round hole that we can meet people where they're at and then provide them with opportunities for growth and development. I agree a hundred percent. You know, it's interesting. So in the way up, I had this concept of, uh, you're blessed to be a blessing. And so the whole, whole point is if when much is given, much is required, uh, I feel enormous amount of, I'd say pressure, but pressure is a privilege of in a position of giving back because I'm just so fortunate of uh, being where I am today. So I, I agree wholeheartedly with you, John. As we dig into the book now, um, let's talk a little bit more about monetizing digital services since 2004, boosting the entertainment industry by making digital content accessible for everyone. AWG. Where innovation meets monetization. Your experiences as a professional of color, um, you, you've had you had this advocate, this person that kind of gave you your break and, and this first opportunity, coupled with your work ethic and your passion and purpose, you were able to then um, deliver and and show promise and 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 develop yourself over time. Um, what do you see in terms of diversity within organizations? What organizations are getting right? What they're getting wrong? Um, what can we be doing better to provide that equity um, to to create those inclusive environments of belonging so that people truly, people of all different backgrounds, uh, all different types of diversity, that they can thrive in the workplace and have opportunity to fulfill their potential? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, a lot of research is in the book. Uh, and one of the studies that I uncovered was one of the biggest reasons people of color lag in growth in an organization is a lack of mentorship and a lack of sponsorship or champions. And so mentor, and one of the favorite parts of the book that I have is uh, where the word mentor comes from. Mentor comes from uh, the, uh, the the terminology comes from the poem that Homer wrote, uh, the Odyssey. And it talks to this fact that Odysseus went to fight the Trojan War, and he was leaving his house, and it was going to leave his son alone, his son Telemachus. And he's like, "If I'm going to leave my son alone, I need to leave it with someone that I trust that's going to be there to train him in the right way and treat him like a father figure." And so the person that Odysseus left his son with was his friend mentor. And so uh, that's the uh, strength to which the relationship is so important that you would trust leaving your son with this person. That's the type of relationship you should have. Uh, when you have that type of relationship, that close bond where this person is going to treat you like their own son, then you're absolutely going to grow. And what I've seen in corporate America, my own experience, interviews in the book that I did, there's just a lack, there's a dearth of mentorship for people of color. Why is that? Some of it is blamed on implicit bias. There's naturally just connection of being around people that you look like, being around people that you know. There's just this natural gravity of of you're just going to naturally bond with that person. So we have to sort of 
be mitigate the implicit bias, mitigate that natural inclination to, you know, go with people that look like you and talk like you and make sure that we're spreading the wealth on mentorship for everybody. That's it's so key. And and I have I'm, I'm owning here today because of the mentors I had. Um, so that that's the first piece. Sponsorship champion uh, ship is a little different. Mentorship. I have a one on one relationship with someone. They're telling me ideas. They had the job that I'm looking to pursue to get. They're giving me tips. It's a really close bond. Sponsorship and champion is. I don't even. I might not even know that they're working on my behalf. I might not even know my champion or my sponsor. Also, uh, they don't work with me on a day to day basis. They're more from a distance, and they're fighting on your behalf. They're in the rooms you're not in, talking about you. So this is what happens in the boardrooms when they say, "We're working on a new project." You know, does anyone know anyone who would be good for this project? Like a sponsor would be someone in that boardroom when you're not in that says, "I think Errol would be a great candidate for it," and they're working on on your behalf. You have no idea that's happening, and it's important for uh, employees of color to be in a position to find their own sponsors. And that means you're always exhibiting the right character traits. You're always have your A game because you never know who's looking. Um, I talk about in the book, when you write an email, write it like it's going to get forwarded to the CEO because you never know. And that's how you actually get sponsors. My sponsors that I had in my career, I don't know what led them to gravitate towards me, but it was because I knew I was very intentional about any time I'm I'm at work. I need to, you know, personify an intentional perspective of who I'm going to be because I don't know who's watching. And I think that led a lot to my success as, as getting sponsors. So I try to encourage employees of color to really be intentional about who they are at all times because someone's always watching. And it's their bet they put them in a the best position to get that sponsorship. Yeah, yeah. And you talk a lot about building your own personal board of directors. Um, this connects back to everything we've been discussing. So, you know, mentors and champions, your network, your sponsors, right? Tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that and how how you've gone about doing that and how others can go about developing that kind yeah. of personal board of directors for themselves. Yeah, it's great. You know, why do Fortune 500 companies have independent board members? The reason being is they need a non-biased perspective on what they're doing. They need someone to look at the CEO and the management team and say, you guys can do better. Why aren't you doing this? Have you thought of that? Uh, that companies are successful because uh, the fact that they have these independent board members that push them. In the same vein, if you look at your career like a business, and you have the same st strategy and the same intentionality around what you need to do, you need a personal board of directors too. The premise of the book is it's a corporate mountain for professionals of color. It's not a corporate ladder, meaning that it's not like every step is equidistance and you just move up. It's a mountain. You're climbing a mountain. Sometimes you might have to double back. Sometimes you have to go in circles. And so from that perspective, when you climb a mountain, you need help. The personal board of directors is your guide, you know, is the person that drove you there, is the person that's at the top that's waiting for you. And so for me, it's a therapist because uh, going through the pandemic, you're filled with anxiety. It's very important to make sure you have the right mental health. Uh, it, it was an executive coach. Uh, that I had that helped me work through problems, right? Because you can have a mentor, but you don't, if you have, if your mentor's at your job, you don't want to complain about your boss <laughs> at your job. So you need an external person, like an executive coach that you can speak to. And then it's also the people that you're friends with. Um, they say you are what you eat. You know, I think you are who you're around. And so I made it a point to make sure I surround myself with folks who have the same intention on growth. Uh, because then you stay competitive, you know. Um, I think sometimes we try to have one foot with our social friends and then one foot in our career, and you can't be two people at, at the same time. Uh, so someone's going to win, and so I've, I've been very intentional about the people I surround myself with, and I have accountability partners. A personal board of directors is big on accountability partners, um, things that you're going to work on for the next year. So I have a good friend, Mark. He's my kind of accountability partner. He knows my goals for 2023. He keeps me honest. You know, and those are the phone calls we have 
once a month or here and there to say, you said you're going to do this. You got to do it by December. It's already February. You got 10 months left. You know, are you there yet? And I do it for him, vice versa. So um, personal board of directors is key. I think a lot of times we happen to just passively let things happen to us. And you cannot do that in your career. You have to be very intentional. Yeah. Intentionality is always important. And, you know, networking often, you know, is seen by many as a dirty word. And, you know, people don't like the idea of big networking events and whatever, regardless of what you want to call it. Uh, It's one of the reasons why I like this idea of a personal board of directors, because you you know, you can, it's mentoring, it's coaching, it's networking, right? It's, it's all those things. Um, But it's more meaningful than going to the big networking events where you're just like having drinks and giving, handing out your card or or getting connected on LinkedIn. Like these are real relationships with real people where you're going to have real reciprocal give and take and you're going to help them. They're going to help you. You're going to, you know, there'll be a sounding board for you and vice versa. Like all of that is just so important. We all need it in our careers. And sometimes it's formal relationships, but a lot of times it's the more casual, informal, organic types of relationships that develop. But if we're intentional and purposeful around developing relationships, I think that will go a really long way. Um, 100%. Yeah. And I'm thinking about one, um, it was a TED talk that I was listening to a while back. And I I don't remember the details of, of, of who was giving it, but it was a young woman, young professional starting off in her career, first big job after graduating college. She goes to work with this within this big organization. And she decided just on her own that she was going to take it upon herself to go have lunch with someone different every day. Um, and that's all it was. Like it really wasn't, I mean, she just thought it would be good to get to know the, the company. It would be good to get to know people. I don't know anyone. Um, she, that's really all it was. But within a year, like she just would go at lunch, she'd go to a different department, she'd sit down with someone, hey, do you mind if I can have lunch with you? And over the course of that year, she just gets to know like pretty much everybody, she gets to know the lay of the land, people know she's the one that's connected. So people come to her, like her, her ability to just progress rapidly was facilitated largely just by that simple thing of of just being intentional about how she's spending her time uh, and, and developing relationships. So yeah. if we can do that, it's going to serve us very, very well uh, yeah. as we try to progress. Yeah. As you mentioned that just spurred in my head. Uh, so I talk about in the book, what's changing in the workplace. So that opportunity to have lunch with someone is harder now because yeah. of the remote space and that we're more hybrid and there's tips that you can have where, yes, you might not be able to have in-person lunch, but you can still set up 15-minute Zoom coffee chats, and you can still leverage private chat. So if you're on a meeting with someone, and I know people in corporate America know this, they have these big Zoom meetings where 200 people are on it, and everyone has their camera off. It's a great time to have a private message chat with someone and say, hey, long time no see, see you on the call too. You know, um, and that's so it's taking the same skill set you're talking about, but trying to make it now for this new hybrid workplace where you're not always in the office. And it's important to sort of change the the strategy now in this new uh, this new normal that we have. Yeah, well said, Errol. It has just been a real pleasure. I note the time uh, it has flown by and we only have another couple minutes together today. Um, But before we wrap up, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, where they can find out more about your book, where they can uh, grab a copy, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Sure. So uh, the book is called The Way Up, Climbing the Corporate Mountain as a Professional of Color. It's out, 1213. It's um, excited because it's one of the number one releases uh, on certain categories, which is great. Uh, You can find me, errolpierre.com, and on all social media, uh, Errol L. Pierre. That's on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, LinkedIn, uh, please connect with me. Happy to share more. And, uh, you know, I think what I love about this book is it's for everybody. So even someone who says, well, I'm not a person of color. I think the tips are universal. I think that uh, if you have a team that's diverse, this is a great book because then you can understand maybe what your employees are going through. And it's just important for that uh, to be known as well. And just happy about the uh, getting it out into the world because it's a lot of nuggets from a lot of smart people. Wonderful. Errol, this has just been a pleasure. Again, I encourage my audience to reach out and get connected, get a copy of the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. 
and I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.